Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'd like to thank you if you were one of the people who introduced yourself in the chat box. We're always excited to see where people are coming from and joining us for these really special events that aren't put on very often. So thank you for joining us. My name is Jacob Arambel. I'm the admissions counselor for the post-baccalaureate program, as well as the Graduate Foundations program here at Columbia University. Um, today we'll be having a long anticipated presentation on entrepreneurship and leadership in times of crisis. And um, as we move into our introductions for the rest of the staff who are joining us today, I'd like to introduce Gabriella Moore, who's our director for post-baccalaureate programs. Thank you, Jacob. Welcome, everyone. I don't need to tell you that we are experiencing some very challenging times right now. And we at Columbia SPS wanted to offer you an opportunity to hear from experts about some strategies for making this challenging time, making the best of it, really. Today, we're going to hear about entrepreneurship and leadership in times of crisis. And this is an important topic, not just for business leaders, but for many of us. Now, I hope you're as excited as I am to hear from our two panelists. Let's move to the next slide. John Boxtos is Professor of Management here at the Business Certificate at Columbia SPS. John teaches managing human behavior in the organization, which is a management and leadership course. He has also taught our entrepreneurship course, which is titled very aptly, Developing and Implementing New Ideas. John is also an entrepreneur in his own right. He has worked in the hospitality real estate sector, putting together deals. Our other speaker, very excited, is Nathaniel Hill. Nathaniel is an alumnus of the business certificate here at Columbia SPS. He was also a student of Professor Boxos. Nathaniel is the founder and the president of Broadway Plus VIP Services. This is a New York-based company that provides VIP experiences to Broadway shows. So this is going to be things like meeting and greeting the stars, uh, going on backstage tours and getting performance lessons from Broadway stars. As you might imagine, Nathaniel has had to pivot his business model in order to cope with COVID-19, uh, the pandemic. And when we spoke, he has credited his time here at Columbia with helping him to remain agile in the face of crisis. Now, before I pass this on to John, I think, Jacob, uh, did you want to say one last thing? Yes, thank you, Gabriel. Um, I'd like to mention once to all of the attendees that this is an interactive presentation. I'd like to encourage you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to put forward any questions you have for the presenters at this time. You can put them in as the presentation is going on and we'll filter through them and make sure that they're asked at the appropriate time at the end. Um, and other than that, uh, please enjoy. Thanks, Jacob. Good point. Yeah, we really, you know, you've got two people here who have um, expertise with very different perspectives on entrepreneurship, right? You've got a professor and a student, someone who's been doing um, this for a long time, someone who has a startup. So please ask your questions. We want you to learn from this. Go in the Q&A, as Jacob said, drop in your questions. Don't worry about making them perfect. We will pass them along to Professor Boxos and to Nathaniel and um, make sure that they get answered. Later on, we'll talk a little bit about our programs at the end. So if you have some questions that have to do with that, those will be tackled by Jacob. Okay, with uh, no further ado, I want to pass along to John Boxos. John, why don't you take it away? Uh, Gabrielle, thank you very much uh, and welcome everyone. It's an honor to be here and so excited to have uh, a large group of, of individuals with us tonight. This is very special for me personally because not only have I been teaching at School of Professional Studies since 2012, I was also pre prior to that a uh, business certificate student when I was looking to apply to business school. Um, and so, uh, and it, it's, it's an extra treat to be here with Nathaniel, uh, who um, was in my class and then uh, worked on the business plan for his company in that class and then uh, went and launched it um, very successfully. Um, uh, so, but I, I want to start. Um, with a story. I want to take us back to, uh, we're, we're in the middle of, a, of this horrible crisis right now, but I want to bring us back to 1929 uh, in the Great Recession, in the Great Depression. And um, 
um, this, you, you know, there was so, so many people had lost their jobs. Things were so tough. This was exactly the last time uh, that anyone would think uh, there would probably be a good time to, to, start, to start, the, start a new company. Um, but it was interesting. There was a young illustrator who had, who went out, who at, at this time went out on his own and, st and started, um, started a, a, a feature film, a feature cartoon film. And um, what happened to that cartoon film uh, will, is illustrated in the next slide. That, uh, that illustrator was Walt Disney. And um, he uh, and, and that that cartoon uh, evolved into Mickey Mouse um, and is uh, as, as for those of you who know, uh, uh, you know, Disney Plus just um, just launched Hamilton uh, this this week. And um, and and from from these very small beginnings, great things have happened. Um, and if we go to the next slide as well, one of the key things that I think we've found um, is that there have been so many companies that have been launched in times of crisis. Uh, obviously, Microsoft, Uber, Electronic Arts. The list is very very long. Um, and I'm I'm always a little skeptical of these anecdotal stories because they almost sound too good to be true. So I wanted to look at a little bit of data. Uh, if we go to the next slide, so th this is from the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, which is uh, devoted to entrepreneurship and um, and they and and if you look the, the actually the highest rate of new entrepreneurs um, since '96 in terms of their uh, their surveying happened in the middle of the Great Recession. Um, in 29 and, and 2010. So it, it's really interesting to, to, um, to speak with Nathaniel today because we're really going to look at, at specifically some of the reasons how um, uh, businesses can and people can take, take advantage of, uh, of crises. Um, uh, in, and, but I, I also want to uh, just make a note that crises are not good. Um, right now, people's lives are being uh, um, turned upside down, people are losing jobs, a number of people have lost their lives. Uh, in no way am I glorifying the, uh, the, the, the sort of the pain and, and tragedy that we're going through. But I think the one of the things that does unite us all is that we're all going through this together. And um, what I hope you can take away from this conversation is uh, some ideas um, and tools and resources that you can use to, uh, to, to help investigate an idea you might have or to start a business or to pitch a business to um, potential investors or mentors um, so that you know wherever you are in this crisis um, we hope we can give you a few tools and a few examples to come out of this um, hopefully uh, stronger and better and and to dealt and to deal with the the hand with dealt as best as possible um, so it's um, it's it's a fitting sort of story arc that um, that we have Nathaniel here to, to, today, because as we talked about, you know, Walt Disney um, uh, has had tons of success on Broadway, um, and and Nathaniel has been Nathaniel has been um, incredibly successful with with his startup. So um, what I what I'd like to do uh, is I'd like to I'm going to structure our conversation today along the lines. Um, of uh, the Sequoia business plan outline. Now, um, this is the, the Sequoia is one of the largest venture capital firms in the U.S. One of the oldest ones. They help uh, initially back Apple and Cisco Systems, among that, many, many others. And their outline for creating a business pitch or business plan is the same one we used uh, in in the class. And um, Nathaniel built his brilliant uh, business plan and pitch around it. And why it's so important is that um, they have posted this on their website and that they've seen so many pitches and so many plans that they, they said, look, this is the best outline that we're going to uh, for, for people to use. Um, when they're presenting new ideas. And it's very logical. We're going to start, we're going to look at the problem, uh, what Nathaniel's solution was, uh, and talk about questions of why now, uh, why, why are, are you the person to launch it, what's the market potential, and so on and so on. So, um, uh, Nathaniel, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, and um, Nathaniel, uh, you know, Gabrielle gave a, a brief overview of, of, of Broadway Plus, and I'd love to start with so the idea. Um, you know, you had mentioned to me when you enrolled in, uh, in the entrepreneurship class, you were interested in entrepreneurship, but you didn't have an idea yet. And I was curious just to talk about a little bit of the process of, um, uh, of finding, finding an idea. Sure. Well, I was lucky that I, I had an industry and I had 
um, a business that I really liked. I, I knew from a young age that I wanted to be in the business of commercial theater. So I'd spent my early 20s and even sometime um, you know, when I was in doing my undergraduate degree, learning that business. So I knew that I was going to stay in this business and I really just wanted to have an idea. <laughs> um, and so that was sort of the, the place that I came to. I'd actually lost a job which was because we lose jobs all the time in our business when Broadway shows close. So that was part of what led me to uh, starting applying for and starting the Columbia program. And I knew that I hoped one day I would have an idea that made enough sense to start as a company. And um, I'd, I'd also, uh, the next thing I'd love to ask is to talk a little bit about the problem. You said you were, you were looking for an idea, you were looking for an opportunity. How, uh, how did you find, um, how, what was the problem and how did you figure out that this was, a, this was a challenge to be solved? Sure. So the problem, I came at it both from the, the consumer side and the industry side because I knew this business. So, I mean, Broadway shows are really, really difficult business and producers are always looking for more ways to, to make money so that we can break even. Um, and so I knew that anything I could bring to the table that would help a show make a little more money would be really helpful. So that's sort of the constant pro pro problem in any, mm -hmm. in any industry, but especially in ours. And then on the consumer side, I noticed that uh, VIP packages of all different types were a big and growing part of the music and sports industries but no one was doing them for Broadway. And there was no way for someone beyond, of course, buying uh, the very best seat on a Saturday night, there was no way to really upgrade your experience in theater. And, and yet there was, I had to assume there was demand because people, you know, they sell really well when you mm -hmm. go to a, a music concert and you can buy that VIP package. So, um, it, and can you go on into a little more detail? What, what was the agonizing pain point for the customer here? I don't know if pain is the right word, but, <laughs> but I appreciate that that's the word we use in our class. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I work on pleasure, not pain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that it was simply that there's demand that wasn't being met. You know, now I, I actually understand it now, now better that I help people solve this problem, but uh, there was no travel and luxury service specifically for Broadway. Ticketing is notoriously confusing, difficult. You don't know if you're getting scalps. You don't know what show to see because they're always changing. And while there were travel agencies focused on New York, there was no travel agency focused specifically on Broadway and no service to help the person willing to pay more to get more. And I think that's fantastic. And I think, you know, one of the things that, uh, but that, you know, that w w one looks at when you're looking at a problem is that, you know, are you delivering aspirin or, or a vitamin? Are, are you, are you helping to uh, solve a problem or uh, take away a pain or, or, you know, give or, or help with kind of pleasure. Um, and, and, um, and I, so I think in, in a way you were sort of doing both. Um, uh, but, but I also, I think what, what is brilliant here is that, you know, I think some of the best uh, ideas and solutions come from when there's a murky um, a kind of a, a, some sort of a, a murky interface. It's, it's hard for customers to understand, uh, you know, and get to what they really, really want. And so you're, ha you're being very, very customer focused and you're saying, okay, I'm going to make this much, much easier for you. And, and most importantly, you know, you found a pain point. Um, I, oh, I'll tell you, <laughs> I know we're not talking about pain, but <laughs> you, you found a way to solve people's problems in a way that they essentially want to, um, they, they are happy to sort of throw money at you to, to, so to solve, to solve their problem. And that's always a really good place to start when you're thinking about a business in that um, you don't want people who are going to, who, you know, are sort of on the fence about something you want to, you want to do. You want people, when you say to this, the, them, this idea, that's fantastic. I would love to do that. And that's always a really, really good place to start. So we've talked about the problem. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the, uh, the solution. Um, what was your kind of eureka moment moment about um, this kind of uh, this value proposition that you were delivering? Well, I would say sort of like I mentioned, it's that there was no, this, this 
product has existed so clearly and was selling so well in another industry, mm -hmm. but not in my own. So I think that was sort of the, that was the Eureka. And I remember, I mean, I think I, I very first initially, you told us you have to come up with an idea for a business. I said, uh oh, I don't have one. And the initial idea was, was it, that I had was a travel agency focused on Broadway, which ironically is now sort of what I'm growing more into. But at the time, smartly, you, you said, okay, what can we really hone in on and double down on? And that's huge. And you're not a travel agent. You're, you have Broadway industry experience. So what's like the very specific product that we can pinpoint and, and bring to market, which in my case was a, a VIP package for Broadway. So I collaborating with theater producers whom I previously interned and worked with, I settled and I settled, we settled on, you know, the deliverable that would be possible would be a package that included a premium ticket to see a Broadway show, a backstage tour with one of the actors from the show after it, um, and a gift bag and a drink in the theater. So that was the initial like one thing that I, I launched with. And, and I think it's great how you describe that because I think, you know, one of the things I like to say is that you always want to find, when you're looking for a new venture, you want to find your unfair advantage uh, in that, uh, of course, you're playing fair, but you want to find something that you can do that is very, very hard or harder for other people to do. Um, and, and I think uh, that also touches in a, a couple of other things. And I think that, you know, one of the, the, the maxims for, for entrepreneurship is that it's really all about product market fit. And if you can get product market fit, uh, you know, someone can do pretty much everything else wrong and still have a successful company. Uh, but if you don't have product market fit, you can do almost everything else right and you can still fail. Now, obviously you had product market fit and you did everything right, which is, which is the best of all worlds. Um, but one of the, one of the tools I just want to talk about for, um, for, for some of the uh, people who are joining us is that if you're thinking about entrepreneurship um, that I, and, and you have an idea, um, kind of going through the process that Nathaniel used um, can, can be very, very helpful. There's a number of ways of describing this. Um, some strategy consultants call it a hypothesis, hypothesis driven um, strategy or an answer first strategy. And, and what you do is you essentially start off by saying, okay, my hypothesis is that a Broadway concierge would be a good idea. Um, so you start with that and then you say, okay, if this is, you know, what needs to be true to make this happen? So in Nathaniel's case, it was, you know, he talked about uh, the VIP meet and greets had been really big uh, in the music industry, but it wasn't in the, uh, the theater. Um, and there's not a ton of difference between music and musical, uh, you know, musical performances and musical theater um, from, from a, a, you know, wide angle perspective. Um, and, you know, so, um, and secondly, you know, as you had mentioned to me, uh, Hamilton had just burst on the scene and the popularity had brought a ton of people into Broadway. So there's a lot more interest. And, um, and, th and thirdly, as um, can you, uh, you know, that your job involved uh, kind of interacting with a lot of these people. Um, and in, if I, if I recall correctly, you said that often you would get requests, VIP requests that you had to turn down. Yeah, it was, you know, I, in, in hindsight, I think like there were, at least three different parts of my life that all slowly came together to inspire this idea. And your class is one of them. And another one was that in the, in the roles I'd have, which were like associate management roles, you know, the type of things that you get hired for like a few years out of college in the, in the theater management world. Uh, a lot of what I had dealt with as sort of like, not my, you know, my main job was mostly like writing contracts and uh, budgeting and, and a little bit of advertising strategy. But one of the things that sort of got like piled on me was VIP requests from the friends of the producers of the show and famous people and stuff like that. In particular, I worked on a show called The Last Ship that Sting wrote. And Sting has a lot of friends <laughs> who are very fancy and they're not interested in going on to Ticketmaster.com. <laughs> so it, all of those sort of came to me and it was a pain <laughs> and we had to say no to a lot of them but part of the but part of what I started to realize especially as I looked back on it was oh like you know every time you every time you say no you're turning down money and I still mm -hmm. say I still train every 
you know, all the people who work for me and that, like we say no as almost never, <laughs> you know, as, as, as little as we have to, because that's a business opportunity. So I realized the producers were saying no, and the service wasn't being properly fulfilled by anyone. So that was one of the other like things that led me to the idea. And I think what's so great about that is that you have a very customer focused mindset. Um, companies such as Amazon, Netflix are very much that way. I mean, when Netflix launched, um, you know, the tradition, as everyone knows, the traditional way is if you had a, um, a premium movie package, uh, on one of the major channels, you know, they had a big, uh, if there was a big series, it would get released once a week. And that was mainly driven by the, by kind of um, a business model focus and that they didn't want to lose subscribers. They wanted to string people along. Netflix came along and said, hey, we have a real customer focus. And if people want to binge watch, let's give it to them. And again, it's that, and um, I think it's a perfect- You must be listening to the Land of the Giants podcast right now, like me. Yes, it's, it's, uh, I love that. I love that podcast. I was listening Uh, to like a similar episode about this this morning. (laughs) Oh, really? Uh, uh, brilliant. No, that there it's, it's so good. And Amazon, uh, they did another one on Amazon, which is really, really good. Again, yeah, I know. Perfect customer focus, but it's, it's really interesting how many companies don't have a customer focus. Maybe it's a, a business model focus or a competitor focus or other things like that. But, um, but just to kind of wrap up that point is that I think if you're thinking about an idea, um, a great way to start is saying, here's my hypothesis. You know, I think a Broadway concierge would be a great idea. And what needs to be true to have that happen. And we listed those three ideas, but let's just drill down on, on one of them. Um, so, you know, with, with the, um, um, with the VIP meet and greet uh, example, you talked about that it's very common in the music industry, you know, as if, if I heard you understood you correctly, you're saying a lot of the tickets are being purchased as gifts. So kind of scarcity, luxury, things like that, showing the importance of the gift is, is really, really important. Um, and also you have the influence of sort of uh, Instagram and celebrity culture and that everybody wants to have a, a, a selfie, you know, with their favorite star. Um, uh, and um, so, and and also um, the the fact that you know you you mentioned that in in your uh, in your experience that there were these all these rec- there was all this demand but not not as much supply and it's really really interesting it was a parallel of the way that Fred Smith started FedEx was that he was a uh, he was a corporate pilot and he was shipping um, key pieces of uh, equipment around from IBM. Uh, around the country because they powered all the ATMs back in the days. And uh, he saw that as the first hand, like you did, that as the economy got more, uh, more digi- digitized and, you know, you were replacing t- bank tellers with ATMs, uh, you couldn't have that ATM break down. So they had this sort of fleet of, um, you know, jets, which are uh, ferrying uh, time sensitive parts around the country. And he, he really saw this supply and demand mismatch just like you did. So I think that's a really, that's a great, that's a great example. Um, so I want to shift gears to the next step in the Sequoia business plan process, which is why now um, in that, you know, why, why was uh, Broadway has been around for a long, long time, as you mentioned, um, you know, VIP t- packages have been around for a long, long time. Why, why now, why had no one figured this out yet? The Broadway business is slow to evolve. (laughs) It's very, I mean, theater is in a lot of ways a tradition. Mm -hmm. Uh, And because it's a very small insular business, there's not naturally a lot of innovation. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and and there's a lot of, it's very unionized. uh, It's very regulated particularly not so much by the government, but more by the fact that all of the Broadway theaters are owned by um, three companies and the presidents of those companies are good friends. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just, there's a lot of, it's a lot of, this is how we do things. No conversation. Mm -hmm. So it was hard for me to figure out how the money was going to flow and how this was going to fit into that structure. And that's sort of what I did in the six months after our class. You know, I worked with you to come up with the business plan and like you said, the hypothesis and what needs to be true. And then I really figured out if it, if it was true and more so how, how to like structure on the back end, the, the financial and the legal arrangements of doing this. And I think that's a, a really brilliant example because um, there's been a study uh, that was done by uh, the consultants Bain and Company, um, which turned into a book called Profit from the Core. And it found that most companies 
uh, that, uh, that most companies get the most returns from focusing on their core business and not going into not going into additional areas. So, so there, I think there's a reason that pretty much any company in any industry generally focus, they stick to their knitting because they, they know it the best. It provides steady returns and there's not, there's not a risk of doing something else or that would change their focus away from it, which is the brilliant opportunity for, for entrepreneurs. Um, um, and, and your example is, is a perfect one. Um, so I guess the, uh, so you'd found this opportunity. I want to shift to the next part in the uh, business plan formula, which is uh, why you, in that what was, what, was, uh, what, what was unique about your background? You talked about it a little bit that you brought to this. Um, sure. Uh, I mean, it, it helped that I'd had a lot of jobs and not a lot of time and met a lot of people. <laughs> At that point, I guess I'd been in the industry five or six years, but I'd, worked with or for I, mean, I worked for maybe six or seven companies and doing that meet a lot of people i mean i'm including internships mm -hmm. so that was really huge because i had to i had to know producers in order to convince them to work with me mm -hmm. uh it really helped that i was young and was willing to take the risk and quit my day job because it was in the theater business, so I wasn't making much anyway. <laughs> um, and it, I think it was really just all about perspective. I hadn't really found my, my place in the business. You know, I'm not an actor. I'm, I'm not a writer. I had worked for, for business managers and I learned a lot, but didn't really love it. So I just knew that it was, it was time and now was the time to, to try it. That's fantastic. Uh, and, and, you know, what I think is great about Nathaniel's story is that uh, as a professor from Harvard Business School, William Salmon, uh, you know, said, Nathaniel, he, he knows and he's known. Uh, he knows the business and he's known in the business. He understands how the business works when he has the trust of the people who work in it. And this is obviously an ideal uh, launch pad to start your venture in that uh, you're going to have existing relationships. Um, you, you know, when you're doing market research, you can call people up and ask them. Um, and, and it's, and it's going to speed your launch um, dramatically. But I, I also want to look at, let, let's look at the opposite side of the spectrum. Let's say you're looking to start a business and you don't know anything about it. Um, uh, I think a great example is Jen Hyman, who is one of the co-founders of Rent the Runway, whose background, who's, I uh, listened to her speak on, on another podcast, um, and um, her background was in Starwood Hotels. And um, so when they were, uh, when, and the, the customer pain point um, was that, you know, dresses are very expensive, and again, in the, in, in um, and in the Instagram kind of era, it's nice to have a little bit of variety. Um, and also, you know, when you're going to different events, you uh, nice, it's nice to be able to, uh, again, access this kind of uh, uh, closet in the cloud, if you will. Um, but one of the, but um, one of the things that, that she and her business partner did really, really well is that they, um, they interviewed a ton of people and they really got to the core of that customer experience. So even though they didn't have that uh, firsthand experience like you did with having to turn down VIP requests, um, they spoke to enough people um, uh, and then they really find out what the core of the customer issue was. And in fact, what, as she recalls it, one of the key conversations was the C was with the CEO of Neiman Marcus. And uh, Jen had said, you know, is this going to, is this going to be an issue? Um, you know, if we launch this business, we obviously don't want to step on the toes uh, on your toes. Cause obviously if we go to a designer, the first person they're going to call is you, some of their big customers to make sure you're not going to be upset. And the, um, and the CEO, um, who is a legendary figure in the business, sort of said, uh, not at all. You know, customers have been renting the runway from my store for years. You know, everyone <laughs> buys a dress, <laughs> keeps the tags on, wears it, returns it. But he said, you know, for us, that's fine because the same customer will go and buy six pairs of shoes in the shoe department. Um, and, it's, and it's a way to kind of um, keep them happy. But he said, look, if, if there is, if this service could actually help us by um, offering a, a service to customers who aren't going to, you know, essentially buy those six pairs of shoes. I mean, that last part I'm paraphrasing, but, but I, I think it's a great way to look at it. And anytime there's a problem or someone's saying no, or there's some kind of friction, there might be a business opportunity there. 
Um, and I think, you know, you, you, you were able to understand the business and start it because you knew it. But Jen did a very, very good job of doing deep research and speaking to those key, key people who could say, okay, this, this is where the pain point is. So I think that, that's a great example. Um, I want to shift to the next step, which is the market potential in that you've got a great idea. You figured out a problem, a solution. It's the right time. You're the right person. But how do you figure out, hey, is this going to make, you know, is this market going to be big enough so I can make some, you know, to make money in? Or, or find enough customers rather? It was hard. I mean, I, I, I didn't make much money at all the first year, but I, I believed in the idea. And perhaps most importantly, one of the, one of the lessons that I still remember to this day very clearly in our class is that we read an article about how most businesses and business models that we know of today were really the plan B, C, D, or E of uh, the founder. So I knew that I had my plan A and it's important to have that, but I tried to stay really flexible. And especially in the concierge business, we, we do what we do, but people want what they want. <laughs> and we've made it our business to get people whatever they want. So I started offering pretty much instantly, like a lot more services. So, okay, I was only working with these three shows but you know, maybe I could call a friend and arrange a backstage tour at another show if the client was willing to pay enough. And like, I'm not a ticket broker, but if someone truly doesn't want to deal with buying their own tickets, sure, I'll help them choose their shows and buy their tickets for them and deliver them to their hotel. And you know, I, I was just responding to what, what my clients wanted. So I pretty quickly and to this day continue to, to build new services and departments. And you know, eventually someone wanted group tickets and those are easier to make money on. Someone wanted a corporate event. So I just sort of taught myself all these different related things and just figured it out and rarely said no. <laughs> and, and I think it's great. And I, I think having that laser focus on the customer and solving the customer's needs is, is what is going to grow your business and, and really any business. And, and obviously you didn't start it initially because you thought, Hey, I'm going to get rich tomorrow or anything like that. You were, you know, but you saw this opportunity and you were willing to take the time and, 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 you know, uh, build that business, which I think is very, very admirable. Um, and I, I think if I, if I recall from, um, your, your business pitch, which I, pulled up and, and looked at, uh, hey, just, yeah. you know, short of the four list. And what, what actually is really interesting is that how, um, how prescient it was. I mean, you were, you really forecasted everything that, that you did, um, which is, which is fantastic. Um, and, um, so, um, and one of the things I recall is that I think you found that the 70% of Broadway, um, uh, seventy percent of Broadway customers are tourists, um, and they have a, a average income of about two hundred thousand um, dollars. And uh, so you've got a, a relatively uh, wealthy customer who is uh, presumably, if they're coming to New York, New York hotel rooms aren't cheap. Uh, no, um, uh, they are great being in the hotel business. Um, uh, that you know, you've got someone who is relatively time. Uh, time starved but cash rich so they're probably going to make the most out of their time uh here um but also that um the background the it was kind of a rising tide was lifting all boats i think you said that broadway had uh, since 2001 um uh broadway uh, uh visits had doubled um and, uh, um, and, and what well, tourism to New York had essentially almost doubled. So you're really seeing a uh, rising, rising interest. So, it, so in terms of the numbers for a market, um, um, I think that was, that was really, really interesting. Um, um, so what, what I'd like to do now is, is essentially look at, and you talked about, um, pivoting from, you know, ha um, and having your plan A, B, C, and D. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your, uh, what your business was before COVID-19 and what it was. Uh, what happened and then what you had to do to pivot after that. Sure. So until March 12th, <laughs> I, I had, I was still doing official VIP packages like the one I described. Um, you know, I think I, but I still had, a, I hadn't really been engaged by more than five or six productions to do that, which is, you know, I, I, I wanted and want more. 
uh, it's not really the goal. The goal would be to have closer to 10 or 15. Um, but, you know, I had had some hit shows. I'd gotten to do Jake Gyllenhaal's meet and greets and Tom Hiddleston's. And, you know, sometimes stars come in and I would know the producer. So I get to work with them. So I was still doing the plan A, the packages. Uh, the coolest thing that happened was I think that as I established myself in, in doing this, I, you know, I, I made a lot of, I met a lot of people in the travel industry and I realized that there was no bridge between Broadway shows and the luxury travel agent agencies. They had always just like a lot of clients had always wanted to buy their daughter a package to go backstage on her birthday. A lot of travel agents had always needed a Broadway expert who understood what they did and understood Broadway. So it was really nice to to have a lot of people say like, oh, I've always needed you. <laughs> and so I'd, I'd been able to build up a lot of the travel business and the partnerships so that travel agency, certain high-end travel agencies were using me to handle like all, everything related to Broadway. So not just the core VIP packages, but also tickets and tours and having dinner with a cast member or arranging for someone to take a voice lesson with a cast member. So that would, that had really grown to be a big part of it was sort of travel agency service services. And, um, are we talking that, that was the, that was the question right before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and just about your pro process of pivoting, uh, in the midst of this crisis. Okay. So uh, we are doing that now. So yeah. then on, on March 12th, our industry got shut down for what's probably going to be a year. Um, and it's very scary. You know, everyone I know lost their job. I had to refund uh, many, many dozens of thousands of dollars in, in money that I, that I had. Um, and I had no idea what I was going to do. So I, I've been doing meet and greets for four years. And I'm still actually the only company that does Broadway meet and greets. And right. I realized that was a pretty easy thing to translate to a virtual experience to Zoom. So, and I don't have to answer to anyone. So I just completely redid my, I stayed up all night, like redid my website and said, okay, you can Zoom with this actor or that actor. And I reached out to a lot of the actors that I, that I'd worked with over the years and, and liked, and I knew that they enjoyed doing meet and greets in person. I said, Hey, do you want to try this out? And of course they just lost their job and maybe I proved myself to them. So they said, yes. <laughs> so I launched something of a haphazard digital platform. Mm -hmm. I, I, I re, reworked my website um, to offer these. And I was really just doing it as a stopgap to try to make a, a few dollars off, you know, clients who I'd already worked with. And all of a sudden, like, People, new people were finding us and people who whom I previously would never have been able to work with because they weren't coming to New York and looking to spend thousands of dollars they were finding us and they were really interested in what we were doing and perhaps most excitingly was that actors said oh I've actually always needed a platform to sell my time like on any given day, something like 90% of Broadway actors are, are unemployed because they're not in a show. Mm -hmm. But some of them have 20, 30, 50, 100,000 followers because six months ago they were starring in Wicked. So yeah. it's, but they didn't really have a way to monetize that. So now we've, we've built a platform um, and a, a tool that an actor can use to, you know, instead of sort of awkwardly writing on social media, hey, you, you guys know you can pay me for stuff, right? We build them a beautiful Broadway Plus profile and it says, this is what I do and this is what it costs. And then we handle all the logistics and customer service and they just show up for their Zoom. And to my delight, they're happy to pay us to do that. <laughs> That's that, and that's fantastic. Um, and I, I think you know that that you were able to pivot 
um, that quickly um, as, you know, it's been attributed to Charles Darwin that he said, it's not the strongest, the species that are the strongest or the fastest or whatever, but it's the most adaptable ones that, that survive. And I think this is a great example of what you did, of, uh, you know, when, um, when life handed you lemons, you, you made a very delicious lemonade. And, um, and I, I wanted to just, and also ask just a little bit about, you know, uh, leadership during this time. Obviously, this is there's a ton of uncertainty. I'm sure a lot of your customers, employees, clients were coming to you saying, "I'm nervous." Can you just talk a little bit about how you led through this this um, this uncertainty? Sure. I think you know. I really I've tried to focus on my mission, which is connecting people and and bringing joy. Um, you know, I'm not, there's a lot of problems, especially in our industry right now that I'm not going to solve, but I know that I can make people happy and I can make actors money. <laughs> so I've tried to just be really clear on, you know, this is, this is who we are and this is what we do. And we're trying to stay really focused and hone in on it. It's been interesting. I've actually hired people. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I I have more employees now than I ever have. So I've I've learned a lot that way. And I mean, I, I'm very much obviously, I like to be in a room with people. That's why I went into the theater business. So mm -hmm. it's kind of sad <laughs> only having Zoom team meetings. But um, I just really have tried to, to focus in on, you know, this is how we, this is how we talk to clients. This is mm -hmm. how we talk to talent. Yeah. We, or, you know, I, I just try to train everyone to be really honest and clear. Um, yeah, not bite off, not bite off more than I can chew, I guess. <laughs> that's um, Nathaniel. That that's great. I I think you know one of the things that. Um, so certainly, you know, when, when there is a crisis, uh, you know, really good leaders should absorb anxiety and radiate calm. Um, and that's obviously what you've been doing with your team, your partners, your customers, your clients, um, which is absolute, which is fantastic. And, and I, and I think also the fact that you have a, a very clear mission and what your goals are for the company, um, obviously helped guide you, you know, kind of guide you through that. Um, and, and I think you're on, as you mentioned, the honesty is such an important part of leadership. I think especially, uh, in a crisis, it was, um, um, uh, uh, general McChrystal, when he was head of joint, uh, special operations in Iraq, uh, when he had just arrived, um, it was another podcast he was, he was talking, um, uh, and he said that, you know, things were changing so quickly on the ground that he didn't know. He, he didn't know what the next step was going to be. Um, I'm paraphrasing him, obviously, but, but he went to his team and he said, um, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what our next thing is, but we're going to figure it out. And obviously he had enough credibility that he, and, and confidence that he could say, hey, I don't know, um, but we're going to figure it out. And I think that was that honesty uh, about where you are and where the, the world is, um, you know, that's really the only, even though it can be kind of scary to say that, um, um, built so much trust with his team, with everyone they were interacting with, just, just as you did. Um, so I, I think, um, and I think also your ability to pivot and listen to the customer was so important. Uh, there, there's an adage that, um, that no business plan survives first contact with the customer and no, <laughs> no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy and, you know, no game plan survive, <laughs> survives the contact with the opposing team when you get on the field. So uh, the fact that, that you were so tuned in to um, what your customers were looking for and at the same time uh, leading with calm confidence and, and mission driven um, is are really e exemplary uh, things that we can all learn. Um, so, uh, and with that, I, I want to um, uh, go into some, any, some Q&A. Uh, uh, if there's any questions anybody has, I know there's a couple questions that have come in. Um, please put your Q&A in the, in the chat box. I uh, would love to answer any questions you might have. Uh, this, this, is, this is the really, uh, I love teaching. And so this is the really exciting part. Well, the, all of this is the exciting part for me, but I love, uh, love getting uh, peppered with questions and it can be for myself, for, for, for Nathaniel, um, uh, go for it. Uh, and initially I just want to answer, there's a question that came in a little bit earlier about is, um, uh, it, you know, where, um, where is, um, where's, uh, how is, um, how is um, essentially venture capital going to, where is it going to come out of the, of the crisis? 
and and I think it's it's a it's a very good question. Um, I'm not a I'm not a, a venture capital specialist, but but certainly I, I think that you know it's it's um, uh, I think any company that is going to listen to its customers um, and uh, you know kind of build for the long term um, is is going to uh, grow and and thrive. Um, uh, the the one Again, no crises are good, but the one opportunity it does give us is that it completely changes the status quo. I mean, if you look, just look at telemedicine, which um, talking to my doctor, no one really did. And I think they got reimbursed something like $10 a session, uh, which is not a lot for uh, I, you know, a doctor in, in New York. Um, now everything changed. And now you know, they're getting full reimbursement. And everyone's doing it. So there are these, uh, whether it's a finish, venture capital firm or an individual, Whenever the status quo changes, it's very uncomfortable. It's very it can be very painful, as we talked about. But it's always an opportunity uh, because people have completely changed their habits. So as we all know, habits are uh, they're quick to form and they're hard to change. Um, but Gabrielle, I'll, I'll pass the mic to you, as it were, and see if we have any other uh, any questions coming in. We have a couple more, John. I don't have a name, sorry. Um, and I'm I'm keeping my eye on time. Of you course. mentioned towards the end of your discussion with Nathaniel, and these will be for you, but also Nathaniel, please uh, chip in. Um, <laughs> something about a business plan that you look at his. One of the questions we have here is, do I have to write a business plan if I'm going to start a business? Um, Nathaniel, I'll, I'll let you answer that first, and then I'll chime in. Uh, I would say yes, honestly. I mean, you, it doesn't have to look like one you found online doesn't have to doesn't have to look like anything but uh yeah you need to know who your clients are going to be what your message is and how you're going to make money yeah and 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 that's really what a business plan is it's really just putting down these basic things uh that questions you have to ask uh, answer to start a business uh one of the myths i do want to dispel is that that to start a business you have to write a 100 page uh, a treatise of a business plan. Um, really, the, the the key question you're trying to figure out is who's my customer, what do they need, and what can I charge them? And really, uh, I think most of the time, you know, the great thing about the Sequoia business plan outline is it answers all these questions. And, and one of the goodies you're going to get, um, uh, what we're um, we're going to send out an email that has a bunch of entrepreneurship uh, and leadership resources uh, that that you can look at. But you know. Um, I'd say most time when people are pitching things, they're probably doing it now in 10 or 15 slides. Uh, obviously the business plan is kind of the backup to that. That's when you, if, if you're gonna cite statistics and in-depth things, you're gonna go into that. But I think you really wanna focus on finding the customer and solving the customer's needs. And then once you've established that, then write the business plan uh, and then kind of investigate those hypotheses. But don't feel like that's the first thing you have to do. And as Nathaniel said, it does certainly doesn't have to look like something you find online. Oh, we actually do have a question specifically for Nathaniel, um, coming from Cindy. She's asking, when you received the news that Broadway theaters were closed on March 12, how did you overcome the initial fear and surprise? I, I mean, like I said, I just thought about what I do and I thought about, is there any way that this could be somehow morphed into an online product. I mean, most of that day I had to refund people. <laughs> it really took a few days, but I also, I'm grateful I had a 22 year old assistant who really pushed me and she said, no, I, I really think people are gonna buy these. And I kind of said, oh, I don't know, it's not very exciting to me, but we have no choice, so we may as well try. <laughs> it sounds like you focused on coming up with a solution rather than like, you know, getting overwhelmed yeah. by the crisis. Yeah, I mean, I just, I thought about what I do. I'm the only one who does it. And I could have given up, but I'm I'm lucky that me, you know, at least I'm not a, a theater director. Like an entire show is a lot harder to put online than, than meeting an actor, which is what I've been doing, so. Well, I want to try to address one more question if we can, and then we're going to uh, pivot to the next section. Um, uh, it's got, got a couple here, let's see. Um, I have an idea for a business, but I don't know where to start. So where would you gentlemen respond to that? 
Nathaniel, I'll, I'll let I'll let you take that, and then I'll I'll chime yeah. in. <laughs> oh, lucky me! <laughs> or, or I can start if you prefer. This is this is the classic, so everyone knows business model in our classrooms. You have to participate. So John, as a professor, is used <laughs> to asking his students to participate. I mean, I I would say you need to you you need to write down the three things we mentioned. Who, what's your mit? What do you? What's your mission? Who are your customers, and and how do you make money from it? I think you got to write them down, and then and then you have to talk to as many people as you can think of who might be able to to help you, whether they're in in that industry or whether they started a company themselves, or they're in marketing or they're an accountant. Just talk to as many different people who do as many different even remotely relevant things as you can and talk it through with them and they'll give you a lot of ideas and ask you a lot of questions that will help you figure out what's next. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and I think, you know, I would, uh, with what Nathaniel said, I, I would say probably the first, the first place to start is with the customer uh, and try to figure out, you know, what's the problem? Uh, where's the big pain point? What, what do people, what do people want to do and love to do, but they can't in terms of, uh, Broadway Plus, or what is um, um, uh, or what is something that really really annoys people? I mean, I think of uh, Square, the payments service, who dramatically simplified payment processing. If you're a small business, I mean, they made it so much easier um, uh, than the traditional kind of um, you know uh, credit card terminals and all these things like that. Um, so finding out where there's in any industry uh, where these kind of pain points, these niches are, and then really go from there. And then as uh, Nathaniel was talking about how are you going to make money, all these kind of things. But I, I think a really good way to, to start is, is with that hypothesis saying, okay, I think, you know, I think there might be an interesting opportunity in a Broadway concierge. What needs to be true for that to actually happen? And then you list those things and then you do that research as Nathaniel was talking about. Talk to as many people as you can who, who would have answers and say, is this a real opportunity or not? Um, and you may find that it's something um, that the opportunity is somewhat related, but but kind of different, as Nathaniel did, starting with the uh, the the kind of the the travel agency idea, and then m moving to to sort of the his uh, sort of me more meet and greet uh, focus focus opportunity. But as long as you're focused on the customer and solving the problem, you almost can't go wrong, uh, because people will want to throw money at you. <laughs> and that we like that. <laughs> you know, we, we, want, we want problems to be solved. We want people to be successful. We want, you know, um, things to, 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 to get, get, get better, move ahead. So. Well, we are going to um, move on to the next section. I want to, uh, if you can stick around for a little while in case there are more questions, thank both you, John, and, and Nathaniel for your participation. It's, it's been really um, enriching to hear you tell your stories because you have such different perspectives. I do want to let everyone know that we are recording this session. So we'll be sending it out to you in case you know you want to revisit some of the points that John or Nathaniel has made. Or if you know someone who was not able to attend live today, you can share it with them. And that's one of the things we are trying to do, you know, especially during the pandemic. But Columbia SPS has always been very good about having uh, our classes online, John teaches online and in person, so we want to have this online. I do, however, before we move on, just want to um, point back to two quotes, one from, from Professor Boxos and one from Nathaniel. So John Professor Boxos said, anytime there's a problem or someone is saying no, anytime some friction exists, there is probably a business opportunity. So I love that quote, and I want you all to think about that. Anytime someone says no, there's probably a business opportunity. And artists will tell you the same thing. When people start to um, censor them or scream at what they're doing, they, they say, I know I'm onto something here. And then Nathaniel had a really good quote. Uh, he said, you know, people, when he was talking about pivoting in COVID-19, he said people or customers whom I would never be able to work with because they were not coming to New York, those same people started contacting us once we started doing this over the internet. So two really great thoughts for you to think about. Um, I would like to take this moment to pass um, the baton on to our colleague, Jacob Arambel. He's just gonna spend a few minutes letting you know about some of the programs we have and how you can reach out to us if you like to take one of them. So Jacob, do you wanna go ahead and... Hi, thank you, Gabriel, um, for that introduction. And 
Thank you, Professor uh, Buxtasso and Nath Nathaniel for joining us today. It's been a really interesting presentation. And um, I think you've highlighted not only kind of making lemonade out of lemons in a business sense uh, when we're in a difficult time like that, which is also something that I'd like to talk about for a moment when we're talking about, you know, using this time um, to learn and to go back to school. But you also, um, uh, Nathaniel's story uh, highlighted the, um, some of the benefits also that come along with being a student at Columbia um, and participating in some of these programs. So I've taken a moment to highlight a couple of the programs where you would be able to take a course um, with Professor Bakstasso. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see um, the first one here. So the two programs that I wanted to highlight today were um, post-baccalaureate studies and graduate foundations. So one is more oriented towards people who are looking at expanding their knowledge for personal gain or are more in the market of shifting their careers. Um, we're looking, um, these are very customizable programs for students who have a variety of interests. It could be that they're looking at choosing a new career in the near future, or it could be that they have a personal interest and they want to take a course after school or, or after work. Um, for these students, I'd indicate that the post-baccalaureate studies program would be your best bet. Um, you have a lot of flexibility over time um, to complete this and take the courses that will help you succeed in the area that you need to, whether that's updating skills that you already know or taking courses and subjects that you haven't had before to prepare you for that next job. So the post-baccalaureate studies program is ideal for those candidates. The other program that I wanted to spend a few moments talking about today on the next slide is the Graduate Foundations Program. Um, both of these programs are offered through the Columbia School of Professional Studies. Um, while post-baccalaureate foundations is more for career-minded people, if you're looking at going into grad school, for one reason or another, you'd like to take courses before committing to a full program, we'd indicate that the Graduate Foundations would be an appropriate selection for you. If you need to complete prerequisites prior to entry, or if you would like to just make sure school is still right for you, the commitment time for the Graduate Foundations program is significantly shorter than a program um, such as a master's degree, which will take quite a bit longer to complete. Um, those are the kind of the core functions of these programs, but just being a student at Columbia will give you access to a number of different things that can help you succeed in your career. For one, I think, um, you know, Professor Boxtosa uh, is living proof. Uh, you know, Columbia's faculty is phenomenal. And the ideas that they transport or import to their students aren't just theoretical. I think today we've demonstrated that there's quite a literal, you know, practical level to the material that you'll be learning at Columbia that translates into real world success. Um, you can also think of Columbia as a place to make connections and meet those individuals who are going to help you in your career down the line. Whether that is simply being in the city and having access to these incredible companies and finding internships, or it is your um, involvement on campus in different programs and activities. Columbia is a perfect place for you to prepare, not only academically, but also career-wise for the next steps that you'll be taking. Um, I think, I think that's kind of the, the core of what I was hoping to say with these slides. Um, on the next one here, um, I wanted to highlight a few key steps. There are more specific questions that I'm sure some of you might have. I, I wanted to, you know, kind of preserve our time today for our, our really distinguished guests. But if you'd like to talk with me about one of these or another program that we offer through the School of Professional Studies, you can call me on this phone number during business hours. The best way to reach me will probably be at info at sps.columbia.edu. You can also make an appointment with me. Um, I'm available via Zoom as well as phone at this time. Um, you can see on the left hand side, or I'm sorry, on the right hand side of this slide, there's a little box that says post baccalaureate studies. This is the menu that you'll see on the website for the program. There's one on the graduate foundation side as well. 
along with the rest of our programs. If you navigate to the bottom selection here where it says contact on our website, you can use that to um, make an appointment with me. So I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Um, the final slide here, there's just a few, remember the dates. Uh, I wanna highlight that the application for fall is due July 30th for these programs. And uh, I'm sure everybody in this room is very excited that classes will be starting on September 8th. So those were kind of the core pieces that I wanted to cover today. Um, Gabrielle, if there's something you think I should mention or add, or if students have questions, I'd be glad to take those as well. Thank you so much, Jacob. Um, honestly, one of the things that is great about working at Columbia SPS are people like Jacob and the admissions team, as well as our faculty and students. So you should know that if you were to reach out to Jacob or anyone in admissions, you'll just, they really are the people who can help you figure out what's a good fit for you. So they'll just talk to you about what your goals are. Um, even if you're not interested in graduate school or in post back, maybe you'd like to take some business courses with someone like Professor Boxos. Um, you want to take an entrepreneurship course like Nathaniel did. The two things we, we really value are our faculty because as Jacob said, they, as you can tell from, from hearing Professor Box, Box those, they really will teach you things that you can apply in the real world. And our students, as you can tell from someone like Nathaniel, the students that you have in classes at Columbia SPS are the future leaders of you know, business, industry, maybe the world, I don't know. So it's great to be among them, to be with them, to share your ideas. Some of the things Nathaniel talked about was how he learned to really pivot by being at Columbia. So these are great things. Um, we're just about at the end of our event tonight, and I want to thank you all for joining us. I did want to mention that next week on July 15th, I'm going to host another event with Jacob called Is No News Still Good News? And again, this is going to be from two of our professors who happen to also be journalists, and uh, Professor Gross and Professor Ambika are going to talk about sifting through the noise of media and social media to understand the facts and get to uh, the truth, and I hope you can join us for that. If you'd like details, you can look on the Columbia SPS website. Um, and remember, if you are interested in learning more about programs or just taking a course or events, you can reach out to Jacob and his team. So again, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Boxtos, I'd like to thank Jacob and Nathaniel, who I know had to drop off for an engaging time. We will send out videos. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So thank you again, and just going to wish you all uh, a good night.